Okay, so this is week one of homiletics. And the first thing you have to do is learn how to spell homiletics. Because <laughs> people have a hard time with that. Second thing you have to do is understand what it means. But the course syllabus, a basic study on how to prepare and deliver messages that are based on, number one, the meaning of the original author of the, the, the meaning of um, of the original author of the scripture used for the sermon, and number two, which, um, th that doesn't make sense. Something got moved around here. To deliver messages are based on the meaning of the original author of the scripture, and number two, uh, how to address contemporary human needs. Special attention shall be given to the minister's personal life, the audience, the text, and how to deliver the message to enhance spiritual growth. A requirement course that meets both the GSOM core curriculum requirements and uh, uh, those for credentialing with the Assemblies of God and other denominations. Course objectives. Upon successful completion of this course, individuals will be able to analyze factors in the importance and success of preaching. <clears throat> Number two, distinguish among the terms homiletics preaching, and sermon, and define each, refute false opinions of homiletics, and classify sermons in various ways, define principles for outline preparation, and recognize essential characteristics, assets, and liabilities of the various main types and subtypes of sermons presented in this course, define structural parts of sermons, and identify their purposes, Characteristics, forms, values, qualities, and principles for preparation. Describe the process for sermon development and point out important emphasis in the development of the preaching program. Describe sermon delivery by analyzing its psychological principles of persuasion and emotion and its oratorical principles of method, style, and communication. Explain how the Holy Spirit prepares the preacher and his message for sermon delivery and describe his ministry to the preacher and the audience during delivery and better understand the principles of preaching. Receive more benefit from the ministry of preaching and minister God's word more successfully to others while preaching. <clears throat> the books, the required textbooks, what's the matter? What's the matter? Just, just settle down, Jeannie. Just settle down. It's eight. Are you on already? This is a fun class. This is a fun class. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to learn. You're going to know how to how to structure a teaching better than you ever have. Okay. The the required reading is Fred Craddock's book, Preaching. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Lord, help me. <laughs> and the Holy Bible and other reading assignments that may be distributed throughout the semester, but it sounds like it won't be. <laughs> the semester, you mean the module? The module, the module, yeah. <laughs> Course requirements. Be here. Number two, exams. There will be no exams. Did you hear that? There will be no exams. Number three. <laughs> is the assignments. Each student will prepare and present a topical sermon based on a topic assigned by the instructor. Guidelines for the sermon outline, the manuscript, and delivery will be discussed in the second class period. Now, let me just share right quickly what I mean by that. 70% uh, of your grade is going to be preparing an outline for your sermon, writing it out, basically word for word, and delivering it. Okay? So we're going to be... At, but. Don't fear, I'm going to be sharing with you prior to that how to do it. What are you doing? 
She needs the key to the van. Okay. And uh, so, so I'll be going over how to do that. It'll be very simple. And uh, it's going to be a fun course. Required reading. You'll be required to read the text in its entirety. And other sources for the preparation of his or her sermon. And the class schedule is there, uh, five weeks in this one, and uh, tonight we're going to be introducing it and previewing preaching styles. Uh, uh, next week we'll be dealing with the concepts of an overview of preaching and, and having something to say. The third week, shaping the message into a sermon, and... Uh, uh, your outline is due, and then your presentation. Well, have presentations the last two weeks. Uh, there's only three of us, so you can preach an hour sermon. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, it, it'll be like a 15 minute sermon. <coughs> and uh, and so uh, it's going to be a good time. Course grading 10% is just being here and participating. 70% is your outline, your manuscript, and your presentation. And um, your assigned reading is 20% of your grade, reading what you're supposed to read. So there's our contact information. Any questions? Okay. So uh, let's see. You can learn how to preach a sermon. And... Uh, uh, let me say this for those of you that may be freaking out, Janie. Or, or <laughs> I have always been very lenient and kind to people saying, based on your particular area of ministry, your message can be directed towards that group. In other words, if, we, if, if a person, uh, like with youth, you might say, well, I'm preaching to youth tonight, or or children, or a ladies' Bible study, or whatever, uh, because that helps you more with where you are in your life, and then it identifies your target audience, so we know that that's why you're going that way, okay? And so we'll talk more about that next week, but just so you know, you can uh, structure it based on where you really are in ministry, okay? Because that's the purpose of it, help, helping you get better in, in that area, okay? So, as we get started tonight, um, let me just ask a question. When you think of preaching, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Okay, being up front. Uh, pardon me? Teaching. Teaching. Anything else come to mind? I was say old men, but I know it comes to mind. Old men. <laughs> How about... Let, let me say it this way. Years ago, if I'd have been asked that question, I would have probably said what you're saying. But how about, let me give you some more adjectives. Mentoring. Developing. Um, transforming. In fact, one of the classes that I'm teaching for the King's University this semester is called Teaching to Transform. And I think one of the problems with too many people when it comes to the preaching ministry or even the teaching ministry is all they're doing is disseminating information. And my conviction is that we already know more than we're living up to anyway. And so I don't feel that my job is to, is to necessarily, while I will hopefully be transmitting information, I don't think that that's not my goal any longer. Because as I said, I think we know more than we're living up to anyway. My job is to try to engage people with the word in such a way that they will want to 
that they will want to, um, this is a different computer and it's not set as well, that they will want to um, um, live up to what the word says. They'll want to go out and do it. In fact, last night, I think it was, um, uh, I didn't preach. I had someone else preach last night. And uh, afterwards, I got up and shared a few things. And one of the things I said is something that's been going over in my mind for the last few weeks is this concept. Um, are we really taking what's being taught and doing it? Or are we just saying that's a good sermon? Because I said as of the first Sunday of September this year, I would have been in ministry 45 years. I've been in this too long just to keep talking. There comes a point where you say, you know what? I don't need this. If all we're doing is transmitting information. Another class I'm teaching this quarter, I taught it this morning. Um, and uh, the, the, the uh, teaching, this one's on the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And the, uh, one of the young girls said after I shared about a, a pastor and about a teacher, she said, well, who are you? You seem like you preach and you teach. And I said, yeah, I do said, I do both. But I said, in reality, oh, then she said, uh, so can you, are you the type of, because I have a conviction that the difference, as an example, you have the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. That not all evangelists are a fivefold office evangelist. Not all pastors are a fivefold office pastor. The difference being that you use pastor as an example because it fits in all, all five office gifts. There's a lot of good pastors who love people and care for their people. But the difference between a pastor and what I'm referring to from Ephesians 4 as a five-fold office pastor is that the five-fold office pastor can not only pastor and does a very good job of pastoring people, but can also see that gift in others, develop and mentor that gift in others, and release that gift in others. So the concept being not all pastors can do that. Some pastors are great pastors, but they can't see it in somebody else and mentor and develop it in somebody else and release somebody else. So that's what I think is the, is the fivefold uh, 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 pastor gift. Uh, then think that's a five-fold evangel evangelist gift. Not all evangelists are five-fold. They can evangelize, but they can't see it in others, develop and mentor it in others, and release others into the ministry of, of evangelism. <clears throat> so I'm saying that to say, I, this person asked me, they said, so, it's, so it sounds like you're mentoring people. I said, yes. And they said, how do you do that? Do you do that one-on-one, -on -one, or do you do that in small groups? And I said, yes. I said, sometimes I do it from the pulpit. Uh, I don't know if I've ever done this since you've been coming to the church, Aaron, or not, but, but there are times when I might be preaching and all of a sudden I'll say, now for those of you that are going into the ministry, let me share something with you right here. rest of you can listen, but what am I doing? I'm, it's a mentoring time. Okay? And I mentor them one-on-one, -on -one and I mentor them in groups. In fact, there's becoming so many that I'm going to have to start mentoring in groups more and then break down one-on-one -on -one for individual stuff we, we got the same thing we got a lot of young married couples starting to come now and they're, they're young married and they need help in their marriages we don't have enough time so we're going to start on sunday afternoons for like six or seven weeks uh having a class so we can deal with a lot of the stuff and then meet with them one-on-one -on -one. not as much but um I'm really not sure how I got there except to say my idea of, of, of preaching is different than it used to be. It's not about information. It's about transformation. So if it's about transformation, I'm just, I'm just sort of revving my motor here for a minute. I told you I love teaching this class. If it's about transformation, then... then it has to have life. It has to have life. 
One of the books I read the other day, it was talking about a very well-known man, well-known actor from years gone by, back in the 30s and 40s. And he was at this um, oratorical convention or something, and, and they were asking some of these actors to get up and, 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 and share uh, a, 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 a reading or, or say, you know, and so, uh, and different people. And so he got up and he had, he quoted the 23rd Psalm. And other people had gotten up, and, but there was this one older lady there and she had, she sort of had zoned everybody out and all of a sudden when she saw people were getting up talking, she just walked to the front and she started talking. And what did she do? She didn't know he had already done it. She quoted the 23rd Psalm. And by the time she got through, everybody was in tears. And people come to this actor and they said, what was the difference? You quoted it and it didn't move us like her. And he said, well, the difference was I knew the psalm. She knew the person. It has to have life. What good is preaching if it doesn't have life? Uh, one time when, um, when I was there at, at, at the house and uh, uh, John Bevere was preaching on one of those occasions he was preaching. And I remember him telling that he had been invited to a, to a particular conference as one of the speakers. And he said, I had no idea why they invited me, because he said they were all very evangelical, very straight-laced, non-charismatic, non-Pentecostal, and he said they were all theologians, and they invited me. And he said, when I got up there, he said, the only way I knew to do was just be me. And he said, people come up to me afterwards, Congrat, you know, he, the, you're the only one that connected with us. Well, he said, I know why. It was the Holy Spirit. It was life. Very, listen carefully to me. Very seldom, I'm giving you some stuff you don't hear in Bible school most of the time. Very seldom do you walk into a church you're not familiar with and you don't know. that is alive when death is coming off the pulpit. Now, I've seen times when life is coming off the pulpit and it's still dead because the people wouldn't receive it. But very seldom do you see death coming off a pulpit and the people being alive. Why? Because life brings life. Death brings death. Okay? Okay. And uh, I, I'm only thinking of that because I, the reason I, I thought about it is, is in, in all my 40-some years of ministry, I've only, I only went into one church where I, I thought the people were alive, but death was coming off the pulpit. And I couldn't figure out why. Now, if I'd have studied it long enough, I'd have figured it out. Uh, probably uh, there's other people that preach and there's other things going on behind the scenes that's, that's keeping things alive. But, but, but you've got to have life. If you want transformation, you have to have life. Because death can't bring life. Only life can bring life. And so um, Aaron can tell you, when I preach, I'm not easy. Am I? I, 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 I preach. I preach to our congregation harder than I teach here. I joke sometimes and say, you know, I thought about giving you a nice sermon you can jump about today, but I changed my mind. <laughs> Why? We're, we're working. We want to change. If you don't want to change, you're in the wrong place. I just tell them. You know, you know, churches are, I don't say this, but I've said it before. Churches are like uh, gas stations. There's one on every corner. But in this one, we want to change. And the only way to change is to preach the truth and receive the truth and not get our feelings hurt. Because sometimes when I'm preaching, it hurts me just as hard as it hurts you. But it's still the word of God. So there has to be life, okay? And so, so in reality, all I'm saying with this is preaching is more than showing somebody how smart you are. It's more than... It, than, than disseminating information. If that's all it is, we're just getting big up here and skinny down here. Okay. 
And it also has to be about more than just even learning good stuff and getting fatter and fatter spiritually. Because if all we're doing is getting fatter and fatter spiritually and we're not touching anybody else, it's all about us. See? And so, so I have some strong convictions about preaching, and you're going to hear some of them as we go along these next few, few days. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, we're going to talk in this, in this uh, class about how to prepare sermons, how to deliver sermons, how to begin and end the sermon. Let me just whet your appetite a little bit for that right now. If you don't catch the congregation in the first two minutes, it's over. If you don't say something in that first two minutes to let them think, he's going to say something, that I need to hear. It's over. And let's say you catch them, and then you give them a lot of good information, but you don't know how to bring it to a conclusion. It's over. So in reality, we should be spending about as much time on our intro and our and our and our uh, uh, conclusion as we do on the body. Now, I'm I'm not. I'll be very honest with you. I mean, this is my opinion of my preaching. Here's my opinion of my preaching. <clears throat> my opinion of my preaching is my, my middle's good. My beginnings are good. My endings are okay. Um, uh, now, now, I always get a response, and, 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 but, but I, I feel that's one of my weaker parts. And I'm only saying that because I've, I've taught this so long, I, you know, you, you, you know where you want to improve, okay? And so how am I going to improve? The only way I can improve that is to spend more time on that, more prep time on my ending. In fact, some preachers start with their ending. What is it that I'm wanting to happen in that service? And they move backward from there, okay? Because we should be moving somewhere. We should be heading somewhere. You should realize every time that you stand before people, you're, you're standing between the living and the dead. It's an amazing concept, isn't it? You're standing between the living and the dead. So, we're going to talk about how to prepare, how to deliver, how to begin and end the sermon. Uh, why don't you share with me for just a minute... Um, uh, just, just take a minute. Who, who's some of your? And I, 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 I want to know this because I, I want to locate you a little bit. I'm going to be talking about in, the, in a couple weeks, lo, uh, next week or the next, locating your audience. If you can't locate your audience, you've got a problem to begin with. Okay. So I'm going to locate you. So let me ask you a few questions. Who are some of your favorite preachers? John Hagee, okay. Let me say a little something about John Hagee. John Hagee is one of the most well-known manuscript preachers in the world. What I mean by that is some people write it out word for word and preach from it. That's John Hagee. If you've ever watched him, you'll notice he's, he's right there and he's He's, he's got eye contact, but he's back and forth. And, and he might get just a little bit away from his pulpit, but he doesn't get very far because he's a manuscript preacher. And, uh, but he's a preacher, and, and, he, and he knows how to... Uh, I, I, I heard that one time he traveled to a town to pre and he left his sermon uh, back home, and, and he, he was almost, I, I can't preach, because you know, he was used to that. Most preachers are not good manuscript preachers. Because you've got to be able to read it without looking totally like you're reading it. And he's mastered that. So Hagee, yeah, okay, someone else. Anyone? Okay. Let me talk to you then. Start listening to preachers. One of the things we're going to be talking about in this class 
is I want you to start critiquing preachers. I didn't say criticizing preachers. I said critiquing preachers. I want you to start listening to preachers for their, their, their introduction, their content, their conclusion, watching their mannerisms, see what works and what doesn't work, critiquing them, getting a feel for their success or their lack of it. Now you do that by listening to your pastors. You do that by getting on the internet. There's some great preachers on the internet or on TV. Uh, who can tell me uh, of a well-known preacher that memorizes his sermon? Joel Osteen. You can tell that he memorizes it word for word, and here's how you can tell. Once in a while, he'll get distracted. Something will distract him, and he'll, he'll foul up a, a sentence, and then he'll laugh or something, and then he'll start right back at that same sentence because he's memorized it. Now, is that wrong? No, if that's who you are. You have to find out who you are and what works for you and not try to be somebody else. David couldn't fight in Saul's armor. Saul wanted to give David his armor when he was going up against Goliath. He couldn't fight in Saul's armor. And so let me, let me tell you a little something here about that. <clears throat> While there's nothing wrong with copying your favorite preacher and trying to be like him, That's not where success is. Success is in using what they do well, but being comfortable in your own skin, who you are. This it used to really crack me up uh, how that everybody had the same haircut as Jeremy Johnson at Calvary Temple. All the young people had the same haircut. One day I started seeing a different style, and I hadn't seen Jeremy in a while. And I said, I bet Jeremy's got a different style. And sure enough, he had a different style. Why? Because they all wanted to copy him, thinking preaching like him and wearing it is where the anointing is at. You have to learn who you are. And, 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 and that's why you're going to do an outline, you're going to do a manuscript, and you can preach from your outline, your manuscript, or just some notes. It doesn't matter. To figure out who you are and what works well for you. But you'll never know if you're a manuscript preacher, not till you write one out. See? And so uh, uh, those that have heard me preach, am I a manuscript preacher? No. Do I memorize it? I write out my own type of outline. That's, that's what I take up to the platform with. Nowadays, I take it up on an iPad because it's just easier, you know. But uh, um, I, you, you, you get your style, and, uh, and, that, and, and that's how you're comfortable. That's how you're comfortable. Now, once in a while, I will preach from a manuscript. And, the, and, and, and the, when I do, it's because I'm dealing with a very sensitive subject I have to stay exactly to what I want to say because of time. And I want to know what I said so I won't let myself stray because it's a sub sensitive subject that I have to be very careful what I say. Maybe it's something I'm dealing with in the church or whatever. And what I'll do on those occasions, and it's probably only happened five or six times in 40-some years of ministry, today I'm having to deal with something, and because of that, I want to be sure that I, I say what I need to say, and I want to be sure I don't say something I shouldn't. So I've written it out, and, 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 and I won't read it like this, but I'll carry it around with me, and I'll basically read it. But I've let everybody know why. Okay. Because um, when you get in those sensitive subjects, sometimes you say things you wish you hadn't have said. But if you don't deviate from what you wrote down, you're prepared for it. Okay. Um, so,
Here's where, here's some here's something else I want to say before we go any further. I'm I'm just sort of getting us going here. I don't want I don't want to assume that everybody in this room is going to be a preacher. So I don't want you to feel like I'm pressuring you to be a preacher. I'm wanting you to learn how to be more effective in communication in whatever venue you end up. But if you are, if you do think that maybe the ministry, the preaching ministry is outlined for you, you need to be doing what I'm talking about, critiquing preachers, going after it, learning what works and what doesn't work. And, um, and, and, and it'll help you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we start tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I say as we start, it's been 30 minutes already. First Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading with verse number 18. And I'm reading out the New King James. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wise, the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling brethren. That not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence but of whom you are in Christ Jesus but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise and what a person has to understand is when they're called to be a preacher, they're called to a foolish profession, but a powerful one, and an effective one, and a rewarding one, and one that can change destinies. So some of my thoughts on the subject of preaching which, which will be reflected in the way I teach this course, I want to share with you right now. I'm just going to share a few of my thoughts. I've already shared a few, but I'll share a few more. I'm not going to emphasize what many homiletics teachers will emphasize. So things such as three points in an illustration. Um, <laughs> I, I was joking with your grandfather the other day, Aaron. Because uh, he and I were talking and we were, we were putting together a, a teaching and, um, and uh, we were talking and, and we come up with two points. And he says, give me a third one. Give me a third point. I said, oh, Mr. Homiletics here, you know, got to have three points. He said, yeah, I need that third one, you know, because, uh, and, and of course we were joking around and everything. But, but most homiletics teachers will say that's what you need, three points and an illustration. Sometimes I have one point. Sometimes I have 15 points. 
And what I may do is at the beginning, I'll say, now this morning I got something I need to share with you. And I've got 15 points here. And before I lose you, because when I said I had 15 points, some of them are more important than others, and I'll spend more time on some than others. So they wouldn't be watching their wall. It's been 15 minutes, and we're only on number two, you know. And once in a while, what I'll do when I'm doing that 15, and all of, all of a sudden I'm at like number three or four, and I realize I don't have a sermon here, I have a series. And so I'll just say after the third or fourth one, next week we're going to pick up and we're just going to keep right on going. There are other times that say if I had 15 points, maybe I got stuck on number six because it was a good one. And then I knew my others, I knew what they were, I didn't feel God wanted me to do a series, and so I'd say, get your pencil out. Number seven, number eight, number nine, because each one of the points could really stand alone. And after I dealt with the foundational stuff, those points would make sense. So I don't go along with the theory of three, three points in an illustration. I'm not going to deal with things like the basic types of sermons. I'll give you uh, some of the names of them. Topical sermons, which is a sermon on a topic. Uh, exegetical sermons, which is taking a, a, uh, a, a passage and exegeting it to find out exactly what the original intent of the author was and try to bring that into, to, uh, you know, uh, in, into light. A thematic, which is dealing with themes or expository. Some preachers are great expository preachers. You know what I mean by being an expository preacher? Verse by verse. I, I had a friend, he's passed away now, but uh, he, was, he was an excellent expository preacher. He would start with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and go to Revelation chapter 21, verse whatever the last verse is, and then he'd start over again. And he'd do a chapter every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, you'd know where you were going to be because it was the next chapter in the Bible. Can you think how hard that is when you get to Leviticus? <laughs> but he could do it. To be a good expository preacher... You have to be called to it. When I say good, that can keep the interest of the people. There are some traditions that say that's the only way to effectively preach. Just preach the Bible through. But uh, uh, I, I would disagree. I'm more of a topical preacher. God gives me a topic and I go with it and, and, and build a series around it. My basic premise in teaching this course is that while what I share and what your author shares is going to be helpful, but I'm of the opinion that our job as preachers is to not prepare and deliver sermons. That's not our job. First time I, 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 I thought that, I, God said that to me. One day he said, you know why you're struggling? No, Lord, I'd like to know. He said, I never called you to preach sermons. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I thought that's what I was called to do. I thought that was my job, to preach sermons. He said, I never called you to preach sermons. He said, I called you to deliver my word to the people. To deliver a word of the Lord. And then he spoke to me. Because I, I was frustrated as a young preacher. Because every week you have to have at least three sermons. And you want to know they're ones God wants. And so if your heart's really into the people and into the word, you're struggling trying to, what do I preach? You know, and getting the right feeling. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, you're struggling and you don't need to because you're trying to preach sermons. You're not trying to deliver a, my word to the people. He said, if you will spend your time Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, spending time with me and letting me fill your heart with my word. He said, you will never have a problem knowing what to preach and starting. You know what I found? I don't. I have a problem stopping. So what I started doing was just started praying and getting in the word and letting God speak to me out of the word and just sharing out of the overflow of my heart what God had put in there. 
In fact, I'm going to say this at the expense of giving, uh, uh, give, giving uh, credence and fodder to those who, who, who don't want to study but still want to preach. Doesn't work that way. But I'm going to tell you that some of the most effective sermons I've ever preached and sermons that made the most lasting impact on people and not only could I sense it, they came and talked to me afterwards were, some, were sermons that took me five minutes to put down. On Saturday night in the prayer meeting before Sunday or maybe even Sunday morning, I'm just praying and worshiping. And that, nowadays, if I don't have a sermon on Sunday morning, I'm not freaked out because I know I've got it in here. I just haven't connected here yet. But when I get in the service, I'll connect. But usually, I mean, usually I have the sermon already before I get there. But what I'm saying is many times, like on a Saturday night, I've been in, the, in prayer and the Lord will say, get out a piece of paper, get out a pen, and I'll sit down and he'll give me two or three verses and a couple points. And sometimes he's given me two or three verses and I said, Lord, those don't fit together. But I'd write them down anyway, and that morning as I preach, guess what? They all fit together. Because he knew. And, and those were the most effective sermons I've ever preached. People would come up to me saying, that set me free from 30 years of something. Now, I didn't want to say to them, well, I did say to them, well, thank the Lord, because I knew it was him. But I didn't want to tell them, well, I didn't really even study. I just sort of got that. You know, I don't want, to, don't want them to freak out. The point I'm making is, here's, here's the concept, and we'll deal with this in great detail later in this course. Here's the concept. You can live that way, and it works when you've committed to a life of study. In other words, I may not be studying specifically for that Sunday morning sermon. I've been studying for 45 years the Word of God. And all of a sudden, it comes to fruition on that Sunday morning. Does that make sense? I've got one good friend. And, uh, well, i got more than one good friend. But i got, I got one good friend that... Uh, um, He's, he's, he and I are as different as the night and day when it comes to pastoring, when it comes to preaching. And uh, he told me one day, he said, he said, oh, pastor, he said, I, I, you know, I mentored him. And he said, I just wish I could teach like you. He said, when I hear you teach, you just connect the dots. He said, I can't do that. In fact, to make a long story short, um, I asked him to teach a, a generations class for me one time. And it was a simple class. And I asked him to teach it because I was so busy and he didn't want to do it. But because he loved me, he said he'd do it. And uh, uh, he came into the office two or three weeks into it and he just wasn't himself. He was withdrawn. He was depressed. And I'm thinking, I wonder what's the matter with him. And I go into my office and I, I said, Lord. And he said, you want to know what's the matter with him? I said, yeah. He said, you ask him to teach and it's killing him. He's depressed. I called him in and I said, how you doing? Oh, okay. I said, well, I, uh, I just feel like it has, I feel like the Lord's telling me it has to do with the fact that I've asked you to teach and you're doing it for me and it's, it's destroying. He said, pastor, I can't take it. He said, it's just driving me nuts. He said, he said, I just can't do this. I said, well, you've only got two more weeks. I said, can you hang in there for two, four weeks for me? If I promise, I'll never ask you to do it again. He said, I can do that. I can, you know. It, it just killed him. You can't wear someone else's armor. But here's, here's the way he operates. He operates and he preaches by inspiration. I'll see, if I'll tell him, if I would tell him I want you to preach on Sunday for me, he said, okay, I, I, I see him Early in the morning, late at night, studying, 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 writing pages and pages of notes for that sermon. And he gets up there and he never even looks at it. He just preaches by inspiration. And guess what it does? It stirs the people. He probably didn't preach anything he wrote down. But the reason he can get by with that is because that's who he is. That's how he functions. But he spends hours studying the word. 
So there's no quick way for you to hear me say, the best sermons I've ever preached took me five minutes to get together. In reality, they took me 45 years to get together. Does that make sense? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So a lot of times people will say to me, uh, in fact, there was one quarter when between GSOM, my SUM classes, my uh, uh, King's classes, my preaching schedule at the church, and I have, I've only had one quarter this bad. I was preaching 17 times, preaching or teaching 17 times a week for 11 weeks. And people would say to me, how can you do it? Well, it was about killing me. But I couldn't have done it years before. The only way I could get by with it is because line upon line, precept upon precept. I had it in me. Does that, does that make sense? And so when, when I was called upon to let it out, it was there. Okay. So it's a life of study. And we're going to be dealing with how to engage in a life of study. Therefore, the information that I and the text will share as a means to make you more efficient in the process of preparing and delivering what the Lord has placed in you is what's going to be vital here. If the minister will prepare his or her heart throughout the week, God will use it on Sunday. Life will flow out on Sunday. Illustration. My wife are in here, she could verify this fact. One of the things we try to do is we try to take, my, my Monday is horrendous. I started teaching at 5.30 this morning. And then I had another class at 11. I went from 5.30 to 9, then 11, and that one's a three and a half hour class, although I didn't take it the whole three and a half hours. Then we're here. Tomorrow I teach in the morning. <clears throat> Thursday night I teach for three and a half hours. And so... One of the slowest days for me is Wednesday. So we try to take Wednesday morning where we try to sleep a little later. That doesn't always happen. We try to get some rest. That doesn't always happen. But we try to uh, fast and pray and listen to some preaching and teaching from pre preachers we like on the internet at least till noon. Or well, that morning is set aside. Now, I can't do it all the time. Once in a while, something comes up where I can't do it. But I'd say we do it 90 to 95% of the time. We, 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 we uh, guard that Wednesday morning as much as possible. My wife said to me one day, she said, you all, I can always sense God's anointing on you when you teach and you always good, do a good job. But she said, I can tell on Sunday morning when you've missed your Wednesday morning. Why? It's my time with God. Time of preparation. Time of waiting on Him. Any questions on any of that or comments before I go any further? It depends upon the you, it depends upon the person. Um, um, do I fast every week? Well, I, I try to at least fast that morning every week. Uh, have I always done that in my life? No. Um, let me say it this way. While I believe in the discipline of fasting, it's scriptural. It, uh, it, it sharpens us spiritually when we approach it the right way. But I think the only thing better than going on a fast, and I'm not saying don't go, we should go on a fast. I think the only thing better than going on a fast is living a fasted life. And what I mean by that is doing everything in your life in moderation. That's a fasted life. Pray without ceasing. Don't overeat. Get the proper rest. Exercise. You, you following where I'm going with this? Yeah, you know, it's a term, you know, somebody coined of a fasted life. Then I think if you live a fasted life and you go on a fast, it's really effective. 
Because it's not like I'm eating all I want and then I'm going on a diet so I can eat all I want again. See, it's, it's a lifestyle. And so um, uh, I, I, when it comes to fasting, I, 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 I've dealt with this differently through the years. In this case, it's once a week in, in that Wednesday morning. Uh, about four years ago, two or three times during the year, my wife and I uh, got away and just fasted for like three days at a time, just seeking the Lord, you know. Uh, two or three times, I guess through, probably three or four times throughout that year. Um, uh, <clears throat> I have never been one, like I know the house is and different ones, I've never been one to you know, start the first of a year for three weeks with fasting. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. I've just never done that. Should I? Probably. Do I call our church to fast? Yes, periodically. Um, uh, but another thing we have done a couple times this past year, which we're going to do more because it's really very effective, is uh, I call a fast every so often on a Sunday for those who can stay after service, after Sunday service, stay between the services and just stay and pray and fast and seek God. And we've had, we'll have anywhere from uh, 25 to 35, 40 stay uh, for that afternoon. Those have been very effective in our church. And uh, I think a lot of it also has to do with the makeup of your church. We have a lot of older people. When you have a lot of older people, they have some dietary restrictions and some medications and stuff. So yeah, I have to be careful how I present it. But uh, there's just different ways. So do I think a fast is a fix-all? No. I think, it, 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 you know, because it's not for any other reason than me. I, I need that to do it. So I can shut down. Oftentimes it takes two days to shut yourself down because everything's going so fast, you know, and the fast helps with that. But do I think that I have to fast every week in order to be successful in preaching? No. Some pastors do. I know of pastors that for 25 years, like every Tuesday or whatever, they fast all day long. They'll go uh, out into the woods with their Bibles and their books, and, and that's their retreat time. So I just think it depends upon who you are and also maybe it depends on what God's told you to do. What you know. So any other questions? I really hope this this class helps you with not only learning how to preach but also just principles of life and ministry. <clears throat> Let's go to page 15 of your book, because on page 15 of your book, and, and I think it's, we've still got the same, uh, uh, does yours look like this? Hopefully. Does your page 15 start with the words case in any class of students? Yes. Okay, so sometimes new editions are different. Page 15 of the book, uh, he, he, the author shares his intent for the writing of the book, and I can hardly... I have yellow and it's not doing too well. Uh, but it's the last major paragraph. He says, one book can serve both the preacher and the preacher to be if the format provides the reader with both a clear walk through the entire process of sermon preparation and delivery and clear markers along the way for the benefit of those who might wish to review or refresh themselves on one particular phase of the process. The structure of this book is an attempt to answer the question, how do I prepare and deliver a sermon? That's what it's all about. This whole book, that's why I chose this book, and I've used it for 10 years in teaching people, uh, preaching. The, process, the, the purpose of this book, how do I prepare and deliver a sermon? That's what this is all about. Now, I really, uh, there's a lot of good information in here. I don't agree with it all, but there's a lot of good information. I heard him, I didn't hear him preach in person. I saw a video of him preaching one time. He's just a little guy from, I think it was, it's either Kentucky or Tennessee. And uh, 
One of the things that he and I disagree on is his concept of preaching is you get up and deliver that sermon and you have a good conclusion and you <coughs> conclude it and you turn around and walk away and you let them deal with it. I think you have to help them deal with it because I don't think most people know how to deal with it. They know it's something they need to do, they need to learn, but they need to be told how to, de how to do it. Step one, step two, step three, and that's where a good conclusion, altar call, whatever the concept may be, uh, comes into play. Uh, but uh, he's got a lot of good information in this book. So preaching is the concerted engagement of one's faculties of body, mind, and spirit. The concerted engagement of one's faculties of body, mind, and spirit. Preaching is an event. Preaching is an event. I do not know how true this statement is that I'm going to make. But studies have been done that say that if a preacher really puts himself into his sermon, that one 30-minute preaching event is equal in, uh, is, is, is equivalent in the exhaustion of energy to one eight-hour day of hard labor. Really putting yourself into that for 30 minutes t takes a toll on your body like working eight hours does. Well, what does that say to the pastor who has four services on a Sunday? Back to back. It's very taxing. People do not realize how taxing it is on the body. Um, and 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 um, I, you know, I don't know if it's because of age or be, just because of the the the, the um, my schedule right now or a combination of both. But this last week, I mean, I got to where any time I had. 15 minutes, I could put my head down and I could be gone. And I'm not usually like that. I mean, it takes me usually an hour to get to sleep for if I'm trying to take a nap, you know. And uh, uh, but but I've done a lot. I've been putting out a lot. I've been preaching a lot. I've been and 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 it, it takes a toll on your body. And um, because it's and it's an event. It's the concerted engagement of one's faculties of body, mind, and spirit. Your author makes this statement, and I'm quoting him. Preachers and listeners hold and articulate doctrines of the Spirit with wide differences. I want to say that again. Preachers and listeners hold and articulate doctrines of the Spirit with wide differences. But the absence of the power of God reduces the delivery of the sermon to a sad repeat of the futile efforts of the seven sons of Sceva described in Acts 19 and 11 through 16. I'm bad here today. So in other words, we need the power of God. If we don't have the power of God, we're going to be leaving something on the table that we don't want to leave on the table. Let's go to page 18 of your book, and I want to read... Read a uh, statement on page 18, top of page 18, from your book. It's a very interesting uh, concept. The first full, full uh, uh, sentence. Speaking that is about God or Jesus or related themes but is not to the hearers, may be interesting and may even be followed by a cordial discussion, but it's not preaching. Preaching is to the listeners intentionally, and therefore even the indicative mood carries the imperative in its bosom. Similarly, speaking that addresses the hearers, but does not have the content of the faith, is not preaching, but empty intensity and hollow exhortation. What's he saying? You need, need both content 
and engagement for it to be preaching. You need both content and engagement for it to be preaching. You need to have something to say and you need to connect with the people. I'm teaching a class called uh, Teaching, I told you this, Teaching to Transform Lives. I, I teach that in the morning, Tuesday mornings. <clears throat> and one of the things I'm dealing with uh, right now in the lecture is connecting. Everybody talks, but few people connect. And there are ways to learn how to connect with people. Most of you have, you know, uh, haven't been at our church. Aaron has. But Aaron, do you notice every now and then I come right down into the audience and just stand there and I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll use somebody as a scapegoat. Why? It gets everybody's attention. It engages them. Okay. Um, something different's going on. Um, and so you have, to, you have to engage the people. You have to connect with the people. You have to do things that will keep their attention, such as we have we have just just a thought that just come to me. We have a balcony there at the church that goes around and comes down this way, and then it has steps that go up to the balcony off the platform as well. You know, so if people were coming down for salvation, they could come down those steps and be right there on the platform. And one time I I was preaching about Enoch, who walked with God. And he was not because God took him. And about the time I was getting ready to say that, I just walked over to where those steps were because there's this huge barrier that you can't see where the steps are. And I said, and Enoch just was walking with God. And he just kept right on walking. And I, I was walking up those steps and nobody could see me. And he was not for God took him. It engages the people. <clears throat> Here's another way you, you connect with people. <clears throat> You tell on yourself. <clears throat> People like to hear that the preacher is just as bad as they are. Or he's got problems just like they do. Interestingly, just to show you how that works. Sunday night. Um, I became very vulnerable. After that preach, the other guy spoke that I had speak, and I told you I got up and said some things. And I became very vulnerable about, because uh, my wife had preached a sermon Sunday morning on uh, principle versus presence. And that you're not careful, you can be so connected to your principles that there's no presence of God. Letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And the preacher, the guy who spoke Sunday night, piggy banked off that. And piggybacked off that. And so when I got up, I was, I was just continuing on with it. And I was sharing the dysfunction of my family and how my sisters have blocked me out and they want to have nothing to do with me. And, and I don't even know if they still live there. And I said, you know, I said, the way I grew up is to think this way. If they don't want to have anything to do with me, then I don't want to have anything to do with them. But I said, you know what? That's not God. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. And I'm their only hope. So the only thing I know to do is fly up there to where they live, go to the last house I knew they were in and hope they're there. Because I had had a dream Thursday morning that uh, affected me over their situation. And I was just being honest and open and vulnerable in regard to how that we have to walk in mercy instead of judgment and not let our old ways of thinking. I had a gentleman come up to me afterwards and he just said, I love you. He said, I've got a sister that won't let me contact her. And he said, you know, I've got a friend that's pulled away. And even this morning, you talked to me about that friend. And, and basically, I said, you know, I've done all I can do. There's nothing else I can do. And he said, when well, you were talking, I said, yeah, there's more I can do. What happened? I connected. 
Now, I didn't share that to connect with him. I forgot about our, I wasn't thinking about our discussion that morning. You've got to learn how to connect because you can have good contact and if, uh, content and if you're not connecting, it's going right over the head. And if you're connecting, but you don't have anything to say, it's going in one ear and right out the other. We need both. Content and connection. Content and engagement. You see, preaching is both private and public. It's both private and public. <clears throat> it's engaged in privately, but it must become public in the end. What you're engaged in, you're engaged in privately, but it has to become public. Preaching is both words and the word. While we preach the word, we do so with words. Isn't that true? While we preach the word, we do so with words. And the serious student of preaching will pay attention to his words and will study words. I have a, I had a friend, he's passed away now, all my friends have passed away. No, not really. But uh, the ones I've been talking about tonight are older than I am. But uh, he, he, he was, a, he had, uh, he, he became the district superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Tennessee. He's a good friend of mine. And um, he was one of those Tennessee boys that was raised on the farm when they weren't allowed to go to school past the eighth grade. You know, they had to stay and they had to work on the farm. They had to, uh, you know, and so he wasn't allowed to go get the education he wanted. But God called him to preach. And so he knew that in order to preach, he needed to be able to communicate. And so he taught himself words. And when he would preach, he was the type of preacher that when he preached, he was painting a picture in your mind. You were seeing the landscape and the portrait of what he was describing. You could see it in your mind because of the descriptive words he used to preach. <clears throat> Here's how he trained himself with words. He read the dictionary and he worked crossword puzzles. And he did it to learn words. <clears throat> because we're preaching the word, but we have to do it with words. In other words, if you're asked to go preach at uh, First Baptist Church down the road here, and you show up and you say, hey, yeah, man, dude, you know, you know, uh, cool, man, or whatever they say nowadays. That's, that's, that's outdated, you know. This is how I roll. You know, you're not connecting. You're not connecting. You're wasting your time. So preaching is difficult, but it can be done. It's difficult, but it can be done. So I'm going to ask you a question, and, and it's not rhetorical. I'd like, I'd like a little interaction on it. Can one learn how to preach... Or is it just inherent within them? Are you born as a preacher or can you learn how to preach? Okay, I'll make it a rhetorical question. <laughs> let, me, let me give you an illustration. Because, and I'm saying this, not trying to pat myself on the back, but I think I can preach. I think that's one of my strengths, one of my gifts. My wife and I had been married just a couple months when I was asked to preach at a church, and that was the first time she'd ever heard me. And she didn't tell me this for about five or six years afterwards. She said when we were driving home, she was saying, Lord, are you sure you called him to preach? <laughs> it was that bad. It was that bad. What happened? I learned. I learned how. Now one way some people learn how, and I've never done this, I don't like doing it, it kills me, but some people 
listen to their sermons. After they preach them, they listen to them and they critique their own sermons. I have a hard time with that because I don't even like my voice when I hear it on a, you know, I think that isn't me. You know, I don't sound like that. I guess I do, but it doesn't sound like that to me. But, but uh, some people do that. They'll, 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 they'll videotape it. They'll watch themselves. They'll watch their uh, actions, hear their content, and they'll critique themselves. I've never done that. Uh, God's given me a pretty good critiquer in my wife, but uh, she's kind, uh, but, but you learn, you just learn, and one way you learn, here's one way I learned, I, I, I got to where I hated walking out of a church thinking, I blew it, I blew it, I blew it, I got to where I hated it so much I made sure I didn't blow it, see? And so, um, so you can learn to preach. I think that principles of connecting and principles of, of oratory, etc., can be inherent. But you can also learn them. But I don't think the call is inherent. I mean, you might have been called before you were born, but... It has to be your call. You have to know God's called you. And so uh, you, you grow into it. So I want to encourage you to critique preaching and to critique sermons. Not with a critical spirit, but with the intent to learn what works and what doesn't work. In other words, you're listening to somebody and you hear them say something and you feel the air being sucked out of the room by everybody. That's an indication that person probably shouldn't have said what they just said. And you take note of that. I may have used this one time as an illustration in another class, I'm not sure. But uh, I remember a number of years ago when I was uh, uh, at, at the house and uh, they have a Saturday night service and two Sunday morning services. And one weekend when Pastor Berto was gone, another speaker was preaching Sunday, Saturday night and the two morning services. And I was there on Saturday night and he said something. And, you know, once you, you get your foot in your mouth and then you try to fix it, it just gets worse. And it was something that he said in regard to divorce and remarriage. And I knew he didn't mean it the way it came out. I knew that. And so that night I'm thinking, do I call him and tell him? Or do I just leave it? And I didn't call him. The next morning he didn't touch on that at all. So his wife was there. She probably helped him out. Okay. Uh, but... But what, what I meant by that was I saw the reaction to the way that was said and I thought, hmm, I want to be careful to never say it that way again. I, my attitude wasn't, what is he doing? My attitude was, been there, done that, wore the t-shirt. I don't want to do it that way. Does that make sense? You're critiquing. At the same time, you're critiquing what works well. You see somebody, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I have seen in years past that I felt worked extremely well that I still use to this day um, probably uh, once a month, if not more, is at, the, is, is at the end of a sermon, having prepared a confession of faith based on what we just taught and have everybody stand and I say a line and they say a line and we confess that truth. Why? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And you can tell when the people are saying it. The longer the confession is. The stronger it gets. Once in a while that confession will be. Seven, eight minutes long. But it's building in their spirit. And they're hearing it being said. And they're hearing themselves say it. And it begins to work in their life. See. So I learned that years ago. And I, I, I still use that technique. 
As I've already talked about this, so I'm, not, I'm just going to mention it again. You'll preach like those you admire, but don't try to imitate them. Learn to be yourself and let God use who you are. He made you unique. He made you just like you are. And learn to allow him to use you just like you are. <coughs> Questions, comments. So your ending would be um, to lead them in the exercise of confession of faith. Well, if I'm doing it that way. Right, that's one way to end. That's one way to end. Um, I'll say, and, and every time I do that, Every time I do that, I have one of the first things that happens. If I haven't already run some off and say, by the way, those confessions are out there on the table in the back. If I haven't already done that, I'll have four or five people run up to me as quick as possible. Can we get that confession? And uh, one lady hit me the other day when I had a confession of faith. And uh, she said, could, could, could I get that? And I said, Sure, but I said, uh, I'll have them out there. If we don't have them out there tonight, we'll have them out there next week. She said, I can't wait that long. I got my phone. Can I get your notes? And she took a picture of it. Why? Because it connected. And, and, and then what I'll do with some of those confessions of faith is I'll periodically bring them back. I'm preaching on something about the same, and I'll say, how you been doing with this confession? Let's stand and make this confession of faith. And, and, and what's it doing? It's reminding the ones that haven't been doing it. Oh, yeah, I need to be doing that. I need to get that in my spirit. And, and I, have, I have people that have all of them in their Bibles. And, and, and now I'm beginning to hear, heard one lady say, I've been saying that confession of faith every day. It's changed my life. It's changed my circumstances. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Instead of talking about how weak we are, we're talking about how strong we are. Because one of the confessions of faith that we've, 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 we've had him say for two years is, uh, is, is, the love, is confession on love. Because God is love and God lives in me. I am kind. I am patient. I, I, I never take offense at wrong done to me. It's right out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Amplified Bible. And what happens? When we first start saying it, we don't feel that about ourselves. We're not operating that way. But after a while, and I'll use this illustration. Once in a while, I'll use this illustration. I'll say, you know, I've been saying that day after day after day after day, that I am the love of God. And because God is love and he's in me, I am love. And, and I said, one day after saying this day after day after day for weeks and weeks, somebody gave me a piece of their mind and I was just getting ready to give them one piece of my mind when I heard myself from that morning say, I pay no attention to a suffered wrong. And I chose to walk away and to walk in love. Why? Faith comes by hearing. In hearing by the word of God. So you figure out ways that work. And then you work them. Okay. Sometimes I have people come forward. Step out of that chair if you believe in God for such and such and such. Uh, sometimes I'll have people grab hands. You just do, if you do the same thing all the time, it loses its, its, its impact. Most of the time, not all the time, sometimes I know exactly what I'm going to do. A lot, but, but a lot of times it's on the spur of the moment. I, I just mentioned this in one of my classes that I taught earlier today. Um, that the, uh, you know, I, I forgot what brought this up in that class, but uh, I had only been at Northside a, less than a year. One Sunday when we had talked about believing God for certain family members, we wanted to see come to Christ, and and I and we passed out pieces of paper, and we had them write the names on those pieces of paper, and then we have some baskets up front. And uh, uh, before we left, I said, I want you to come down here, and I want you to put those names in here, and we're going to be praying for these people. And then we prayed in mass, and then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and He reminded me of something that happened in the Word, where the prophet laid over that dead boy 
mouth to mouth, you know, and laid on him and life went into him. And God said, pour those out on the ground. And I poured them out on the ground and he said, lay on them and pray on them. And I laid down and I, now I, I'd only been going there last night. I didn't know what the people were thinking. But I said, I've got to be obedient to God. This is what God's telling me to do. Never thought another thing about it. Probably a year later, one of the older ladies that's very respected in the church come to me and she said, Pastor, I've got a couple great testimonies of salvation. Do you mind if I take just a minute tonight and share it? I said, no, okay, you sure, you can. And she said, I, 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 uh, she said, one day the pastor had us write names. And then he did something and she said, I've been in church 70 years and I've never seen anybody do this. But he said, God told him to do it. And he laid out on the, and I'd forgotten. I'd even forgotten I'd done it. She said, I'm here to tell you, two of those names have already come to Jesus. And I'm believing God for the third one. What, what it was, that act engaged them. It connected with them. They'd never seen it. They didn't understand it. But they didn't forget it. But I didn't just do it either. God told me to do it. You have to engage the people. Okay, for me to go into the next part would take about a half hour, 45 minutes, so we're going to call it a night. I hope you got something. I'm passionate about this subject and uh, enjoying teaching. So have a good night. God bless you.